Awesome. That's great. I think Joe has done most of the introduction, but I will try doing the best I can again. Um, hi, Joe. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Design Board and ADP group sessions. I'm Devki Nandini, and I'm your host on behalf of Design Board, and we have Utkarsh from ADP List. Uh, so today's topic, a uh, little introduction for today's topic is that a product's UI is the cherry on top and more. Users will relish it when it feels natural and comfortable, but if experimented beyond usability, it might affect the overall experience and the business as well. So we have Joe today, who is a design services manager at Uncork, who feels your processes and best practices define the success of your UI. So we will understand the research, concepts, testing, and building of the right UI system in a nutshell. So thanks for joining us today, Joe. The stage yeah. is yours whenever you're ready. Awesome. Thank you so much. So obviously, I got to say thank you to you for having having us here. Um, ADP list, if you, you know, quick plug, because I can't not plug it. If you have not booked time with a mentor or even know what the ADP list, we are a global mentoring community. It is free. It is easy to access. You can find anybody under any discipline you want. Um, and it's fun. It's just fun to meet. You get to meet people like me who are insanely passionate about design and we'll talk. I have 40 minute blocks and everyone is like, hey, shit, we got to go. I have another one because uh, I think talking about design and being ex excited about what you do is just it's just a gift. And I think that's something that uh, if you're here, maybe you're already in design. If you are new to it or just get into it, you know, welcome. There's going to be it's going to be a fun ride. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, so I've been doing design forever and a day. Uh, it's, I'm going into year 22, which is terrifying because it's when you look back at what you've gotten to see and what you've gotten to experience over 22 years in one industry, it's uh, nearly remarkable how it's changed, right? Um, I started off as a graphic designer. So this is why UI is always something that is super, super like important and passionate to me. It's it's what I started with. Like uh, for everybody else who's not us, they assume we just make things pretty, uh, which is great. It's fun, uh, but we obviously obviously are so much more than that. So what we what we always strive to do is bring the best visual representation to the world. And I think from my journey in the start of doing graphic design, doing packaging, doing advertising. And in those early 2000s, when uh, always dating myself, when I say this, like when the web became a thing and we started looking at uh, how websites were built and how we can really create around it, right? And we had a space that was new to us. You know, if you look at the evolution of design from like painting and how we used to do advertising that were, um, that were that was art that, that were hand drawn ads to how like the computer came and evolved and now we have we're pushing our limits even further with what we're building in and we have small screens we have large screens and we have terrifyingly large screens i have friends that have like 42 inch wide curved displays and i'm like what do you look at on there it's insane um but it's all that's what we do right like this is our job is to always evolve and always keep going so once the web started really kicking off and we had to focus around not only how we design a good experience from a UX standpoint, because UX has always been around, we just have a fancy name for it in the last 10 years, to how UIs are engaging. You know, originally, which uh, for, I don't know if anybody remembers this outside of me, you know, we only had two fonts. We had like a serif and a sans serif, and it was probably Arial Helvetica, and like a base font and Times New Roman. Amazing. Like it was just, it was crazy to think back that we only designed, we designed tons of pages with two fonts. So what if you were a brand? Like how would you find a way? Images. You mm -hmm. would just embed images of your logos, of anything of important text. Uh, and it was wild. So the UI has always become part of how we keep representing a brand, how we keep representing our, our own feelings about things. You know, styles always come into play, which I think is such a beautiful thing as, as you meet designers and as you know designers and you see how they work, 
what their style is. Like <laughs> we all have a specific way of doing things. Like we have our we have our safe space of how we're going to design and. Um, I, that's a long, long intro for me. Uh, <laughs> I, I dove right in. So what I want you guys to do today, this is going to be us together talking. If you have questions, drop them in the chat. If you're shy, if you want to raise your hand and ask a question, raise your hand and ask a question. I'm going to be rambling at you guys for a little bit, but I want you guys to, to always keep thoughts in mind of what comes up to you. One of the things that I want you to think about throughout all of this and we'll, we'll touch on this at the end. What is a good UI design to you? What have you seen out in the world? And it's funny because whenever we go back and uh, we're, we're planning a talk down the line of what us old head designers have done over the years, what did my portfolio look like 10 years ago? Not great. Not great at all. Um, but what does it look like now? You know, how trends change and how we keep up with everything. So it's it's such a an amazing space to be. So one of the things that um, I didn't make many slides, but I'm going to show you guys one, which is uh, always one of my favorite slides to bring out to um, the clients. You guys, please watch my weird stuff all over my desktop. This is my fun shit. The design process, right? We've all seen this slide a thousand times over. We all know what it is. It's how we start product design, right? I'm gonna use the term product design overarching, as we all know. It has a thousand terms now. But you know, when I meet with a client from out any of my jobs, I let them know what this is. You know, we start with discovery, we start with our UX concepts, we understand why, the how, the what we're doing and why we're doing it and then we put together those wireframes and those rough ideas that lead the way for the rest of the rest of our journey right then it comes to the design aspect and and people always look at this and go oh it's time to design all right you have the wireframes just put a skin on it and that's not how it works because when we're done with this, we hand it off to development and then we optimize. And, you know, as we do our, you know, test and learn version of design, like this all comes into play. But in reality, once we hit design, we're back in almost a UX style scenario. And this is where we talk about, and for uh, the line is not straight and it's driving me nuts. Uh, <laughs> branching between the two. People need to understand that there's so much more that goes on in design. You know, people who are UI designers, they start to understand why, how UX comes into play more when they deal with UX designers because it's the research, right? If I'm a traditional graphic, a traditional graphic designer, back in the day, I would still look at trends. I would still research who I'm, who I'm looking to display this work for. Where is it gonna be? If I was doing package design, you know, talking through the idea of where it could be in a store from like a physical aspect, because my visual design for how I'm going to drag, drag people into it, it, I needed to know. I needed to know where it's going to be. So this discovery and concepting as we go into the visual design process is so essential. So when you start your process, right? You have to think of it as a reset. And I love the idea of doing this because for a lot of companies, you know, even if you have a very robust design system, there's still so much more you can build into it. Um, we have great, we have great tools with us. Figma, Sketch, I guess is still there. Uh, XD does some very amazing things right. A lot of things wrong. Adobe, don't at me. Um, but it's it's how we how we use the tools, right? And this is how it's always been. You know, when you're building a UI, people are just like, and I'm still envious of some of my friends who are amazing Photoshop people. Like they can take an image and either manipulate it or extend it or give it depth or create with it. And that for me was always like. Fuck, I'm not good at that. That's not my strong point. Illustrator, all day long. You want me to draw stuff out? I got you. 
but it's it's knowing how your tools work and getting constantly better at how you use them. So uh, there's a quick, quick question, favorite example of good UX. This is the best part about UX in general, because we're going to stick mainly to UI today, but when it comes to UX, and you guys are, I refer to this, I constantly say we're all students of UX, right? We all have a phone or interact with literally anything. Um, so we all know what's good and bad in our own experience. So a good, a good example of a good UX for me is always something that I don't know that I'm, I don't know how to use. If I get a new app and I can automatically navigate around it, I'm automatically like, oh, that was strangely instinctual. Bad UX though, I could tell you a thousand times was bad UX because those things stick with me. And it's funny, my, my girlfriend is a nurse, so she's not in the industry. But from being around me and hearing me talk about these things, it's, she recognizes where bad UX is. And I'm sure she remembers the bad UX and the good UX, because good UX you never even notice. So for me, it's like the updates that uh, companies like Apple make, and obviously all the big tech companies, that's their job. If they're, not, if they're doing shit UX, that's a bigger problem for the rest of us. For me, I love the way, I love physical UX a lot. Like I have a, a Nissan, shameless plug for Nissan. I have a Nissan Rogue. I love the fact that it has things like I can set different seats for different users. So if I get in the car, I push one, it sets my seat back, it sets me up for how I'm gonna drive. If my girlfriend gets in the car, presses two, it moves the seat up, lifts it up and gets her ready. So I think that's, and those are so, Sim, like seamless things that build into your lifestyle. Like even when it comes to digital products, like as we create digital products, I have to have in my, in my head, what's going what's gonna to impede a user? Mm -hmm. So again, I'm going to try to stick to stick to UI. So how do you start the process, right? How do you, how do you build a foundation of a process? So we have two types of processes. We have our own process. That's the one that starts with us. And that's where we have to start setting solid goals and solid uh, routines for us. And this sounds so funny because it's like, these are the same things that help you lose weight and go to the gym and all this stuff. But the routines mean a lot to us from a, from a design standpoint. Because if you start for yourself, one of the things I say to every designer, when I meet them on the ADP list or I meet them in person or meet up or whatever, is build your own UI kit. And it does two things. One, it helps you learn how to how and the best way to build tools in Figma. We're going to talk about Figma all the time because let's be serious, Figma is it. Um, shameless plug for Figma. They they built a way to build the library with variations and everything else inside of it. We need to know how to do that. Every time there's an update, find a way to refine your library. So if you're in a new job or you're meeting a new client or you're doing something else, you can bang through those things quick. Like back in the day when we were doing visual design for like regular print or regular like early stage web, we'd still have a library mm. of icons, a library of color schemes. Those are the weird things that I've kept along with me this entire time. Because for yourself, you need to have these things handy, you know? So I always say, build your own UI kit understand how parts work, understand where you can push things. Like, I think that's one of the, the first things that'll always help you grow is understanding how to use your tools. And then the second part of it, which is just a, a very selfish thing, is once you have a UI kit, if you have freelance work, you just dupe that bad boy up, change the colors, change rounded buttons, whatever you need to do, and then you can build products super easy. And again, going back, much like how we do in an iterative process throughout, you know, working in general, if you build a new component for a client and it works and you love it, take that, drop it right into your main library. So then you have a library that grows. That's for you, right? Also for you. This is all about how things look. Be inspired by literally everything. And I say that in such a weird way because there are things that you can be inspired by in a good way and be inspired by in a bad way. Um, key points, I live in New York, no surprise. 
obviously Mad Hat, New York stuff everywhere, sent. Um, every time I walked through, this is going back to when I was a kid. I would walk through Manhattan. I would see advertising everywhere. I would see design everywhere and always see it and be like, oh, that looks good. From high-end stores to low, like to bodegas, because bodegas sometimes, there's always, okay, there's always a designer in a neighborhood that wants to do, to do free work just for their portfolio. And somehow that was me when I started out at Pizza Place Flyers. I would do that shit all the time. Um, but they, but that's what you'll see. You'll see good design. You'll see fun design. You know, Instagram. I follow the hashtags for UX design, UI design, Figma, all the stuff, because I constantly want to get inspired by stuff. And that's, and this is where it's inspiration in a good way and inspiration for bad too, because you can see really great design over and over again. And then you'll see the same design over and over again. Like one of the things a lot of young designers, especially when you come out of boot camp, right? Boot camp tells you to design a portfolio a certain way, write the narrative a certain way, because you're learning. When we started back in the day, it was the same thing. We were taught to do things a certain way. That plain white, hello, my name is, maybe a photo, lead into your case studies is great as a starting point. Because what we always have to do, much like as we do wireframes before we do visual design, we have to have a basis for how we're gonna evolve. So one of the things a lot, especially if you're a UI designer, if I have, if I look at your portfolio and it's just like very, very stark and want to see that work like deeper in the, in the case studies and what you can do. Um, and it's, it's very interesting to start finding your own brand, right? Like to be fair, I have now, if I go through all the years of my, of my website, changed color schemes a thousand times, changed my logo now three times. Um, because it evolves with you, right? I had to rebrand myself countless times. So which, with every one of those, my style changed. A little bit of like, there's a whole section of websites that I did that had like very big sans serif fonts. And then some that have like very minimal serif fonts. Some of them have like color blocks and some of them have like pinstripes. There was a pinstripe face. I don't know, even know where that came from. Yeah, me. Um, but that's for you, right? Like it's always finding your way, finding your way around and finding your, who your voice is. And then this is the same thing. Like as you start getting used to doing it for yourself, you could do it for your clients. You know, as we do, clients can have branding, right? Totally fine. You have colors, depending on how mature they are. They can have colors, a logo, some type styles. How do you bring, like, let's say they use Gotham as a headline font and, Maserat as like a body font. How do you really bring those fonts to life? You know, so I think that's part of, for you always looking at things, looking at, you know, I saw the example of Apple in here, like Apple does things great, right? Like their pages have movement. <laughs> Every time it feels like it's three-dimensional, feels like it's alive. And that's a whole other realm of UI that we're going to talk about in a little bit. But that, can you take Apple's design and swap it out for McDonald's and it'll still work. Maybe, maybe not. If I had a burger coming apart and going back together, I think it'd be really fly, but like, it doesn't help it sell. No, because we all know we're getting a smash burger at the end. Um, so one of the questions that, that right now are in the chat is most of the times clients want to see final output or something on paper, even when you're still in the UX research phase, how do you help them understand it takes time? Wow. So we can spend hours talking about clients. Um, it's all about, it's all, so taking a step back, it's all about process, right? It's all about letting them understand where everything is. If you can start scoping, like one of the things that I'm teaching a lot of my designers to do, especially early on, especially if you're right out of, right out of school, is understanding how much, how much time you need to get things done. Like right now I'm in a, I'm, in a phase just like this. Yesterday I presented wireframes. 
uh, for like this whole uh, this whole UX uh, experience. They said, "Oh, so it's not going to look like this, right?" No, we have a whole team that I'm building separately that's going to be applied to this. This is just so you understand how it works. Oh, because we thought that it was going to be, you know, that we thought this was pretty stark. Yeah, it's black, white, and gray. It's dark. This is supposed to be like bright green. Like, and they were like, oh, so when are we going to see that? And I said, well, we need to establish how it's going to work first because and I always, I, I, no, no surprise. I'm sarcastic. Um, I always say like, <laughs> I can do it now, but then I might have to redo it later. Do you want me to keep redoing work or do you want me to get it done right first? And this is where we go back to the process. At the start of every meeting, I show that chart. I say, here we are now. This is what we're going to cover. Here's how long it should roughly take. Because obviously, once questions come in and like iteration happens, I try to give like an approximate time. We'll get the visual design two weeks from now at the end of this sprint, or two weeks from now, or two weeks from or four weeks from now. You know, like we need to make sure we have 63 pages to do. Like, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to just redo that. I want to make sure everything is right. And I, I, I mentioned before I'm in construction in the house. You know, it's I use analogies constantly. If it's not food, if it's not coffee, it's usually construction Legos. Um, you wouldn't build the structure of a house, put up the drywall, and then say, "I wonder where the electric goes." Mm -hmm. No, you want to put that electric in first. You want that plumbing in first. You want all the things that need to make the space work there. Then you put the drywall on. Then you put the paint on. And if you're me, it's taking a little longer than we really expected, but the house looks great. That's all that matters. Um, so it's always making sure. And this is, I use analogies a lot because sometimes we get very technical. You know, this is like the whole thing. Uh, we're going to touch on the whole idea of, uh, of UI in emotion, right? Like this is what I'm going to talk about now. Why not? Um, when you pick colors for, for a client, if they don't have a brand or you're building a brand for them and you're picking colors and you build different um, palettes for them, one of the things that I've heard very conflicting things some people say it's not true. Some people say it is true. I believe colors evoke emotion. Oh, I, mean, I believe if this is a healthcare company, we're not going to make them dark blues and a very heavy dark pattern. Because the idea is if you're a healthcare company, your people need to feel safe and warm and should feel like the hospital settings that they're in and everything else. So it should have that like nice teals, those very warm, soothing colors, those areas of white space that make it feel like very easy to read, you know, because this is all information and that is hard to gauge. You know, I think it's, uh, I a hundred percent, I was just going to say colors are tough because if you're building colors, oh my God, perfect, perfect, uh, story, story time. Um, a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago, 2017, geez, time doesn't exist. Uh, mm -hmm. 2017, I'm working for American Express. Uh, we were doing international market rollouts. So during the market rollouts, we hit Asian markets and we had this whole meeting and we said, hey, so um, we're going to, here's what, here's what your old page looks like. Here's what it's new going to look like with the new branding that have that we've been working on and the new reusable components and yada, yada, yada. It's going to be awesome. It's going to load fast. It's going to look great. It's going to be consistent. They said, so here in Asia, CTAs, uh, like call to action buttons need to be red. And I'm like, okay. So the, in, in the US, red means stop. Red means bad. Red means warning. I'm like, I, I don't know. I talked to the team. I'm like, guys, how, how can we make like a, like a, another one that's like a whole style guide around Asia that they, we use the red buttons? They go, well, size it out. Got it. Everybody who knows products knows once you talk to dev, it takes a couple of days to get some information back because they have to scope their work too. 
And I went back and I said, listen, because brand for me, it's always brand is the most important thing because consistency means a lot. But as cultures come come into play, how do we best uh, serve the people that we're displaying this information to? So we said, we want to run an A-B test. When we launch the new site, we're going to do a 50-50 red buttons, blue buttons, and see how it affects conversion. Because we also got word from up high, as everybody loves word from up high. Uh, no, our brand is blue. But red is good there. Blue may not increase conversion as much as you want. It'll cost you money. Oh, well, we should check that. All right. So we ran it, right? And one of the coolest things that I got to see was because we obviously throughout the entire time we tested uh, one to one, seeing how the trends kind of worked, seeing how like the red button was performing really well at one point, and then the blue button started performing well, and then the red button started performing well, and I was like, we ended up at this place where it was like a like a forty eight fifty two split, where it was it was red primarily doing better. So I was like, oh, shit, all right. So it does have an impact because it, it's, but people can still feel comfortable with both. So we you know, brought the findings to the market. They said, um, you know, well, we would prefer the red buttons. We ended up doing the red buttons uh, <laughs> because it doesn't impact. If it impacted conversion in any way, shape or form, we'd have to look back and be like, listen, the blue button is performing well. You know, the red red button was underperforming or the red button was blowing it out of the water. We should like look at it. So I think that's where everything goes. A great question about uh, A-B testing. So this is also where in a UI scenario, uh, A-B testing is such a great tool. So we can, A-B testing in general, if you're at a company that has the maturity to run an A-B test, do it. Like, Siri apparently wants me to uh, explain A-B testing too, because it found it on the web. Apparently I might not be doing a good enough job. Um, this is, so I love the, ter I love the term, uh, it's big here, fuck around and find out. Uh, it's usually meant as like, if you wanna, you wanna find out, well, fuck around, find out. You know, I may be throwing hands, but in, in design, it gives us the opportunity to be expressive, right? Like create. Like if you see an experience and you're like, eh, not terribly thrilled with the way that looks. I'm not terribly thrilled with the way it's working with the flow of the page. Maybe we can do it better. You know, work with your teams to figure out a way that you can test it one-to-one. -one. You know, you release it. If you could do live testing on site, that's always good. If you have to do like uh, online testing, like something like Zoom, get people together, ask them what their opinions are, take the information. That's also great. I'm always a big fan of in-person testing because then you can like deep dive down questions. Like, oh, like it's not a, this did better from like a conversion or engagement standpoint. It's more of like, so what don't you like about it? What, tell, tell me more about how this makes you feel. Tell me more about it. This is where like, as a UI designer, you still have to know UX a little because Think about how the questions you would ask, like the question about color, you know, how does this color make you feel? How does this, how do the button styles make you feel? How, do, how does all this, uh, is this engaging to you? It also works into the disadvantage because I've done user testing and I've had people say, oh my God, I love this, but I just hate the teal. Okay, yeah, just we're really focusing around like, how you can get down in the funnel and like you can buy clothes. Oh yeah, no, 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 I'll do that. But it's just like, just not my, this just not my color. Totally fine. 15 minutes later. You know, I really like all this about the, except that teal. It's just, it just, it makes me feel very angry every time I look at it. I'm just like, all right. Yeah, we know the teal, you hate the teal. Great, no problem. What about the words? Are the images good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if you didn't use the teal everywhere, maybe it would be so, fuck. 
And it's like, you have to internalize all of that and just kind of like let it happen. But that's what people do, right? Like we all do that. We all get hung up on little details sometimes. And once you start doing UX research a little more, you're going to learn the little details don't fucking matter. Um, Because you know there's a bigger picture in mind. So this is where, as we continue to, to build and evolve, like our process for ourselves, you know, like uh, the question here about uh, best practice for creating a color palette for web and mobile. You know, this is, these are things that I constantly have uh, inspiration boards or I have like palettes or I have like Figma files that I find shit and I love it because I want to grab, pull it, pull it out for like a project I'm working on. Key thing, whenever you're creating a color palette, accessibility. If I can have like a magic graphic pop across, it would just be like, like it's, it's essential. You know, and some people, there's a whole group of people out there be like, oh, accessibility ruins color schemes and yada, yada, yada. I'm like, it doesn't. If you know color theory and you know how to use colors correctly, you can still make things accessible while still using an amazingly in-depth color palette. You know, it's just, it's how you do it. You just don't make uh, buttons like a light gray with white type on it. It's not, that's, none of that's that hard. It's just make sure, like, I get it. Sometimes you get this really, really nice color, this like really nice red or blue or green, and it looks very engaging and you want people to click on that button and the uh, white type on it may just not be accessible that you have to make it darker just make it darker, right? Or use an outline button. You know, like you find your ways around it. So I think that's part of it. So for me, I try to use the same palette no matter what for mobile and, and web. For mobile and yeah, mobile and web. And the main reason why is continuity. For me, I'm a big branding guy. I don't want any person to go from an, uh, an Instagram ad to a website to an app and make it not feel seamless. I you know, you use things in a way consistently. Like if you're going to use um, banners in a, you know, like a, a dark blue, you know, try to keep that mo that feeling consistent. If you're going to use all headers, like the best part about a design system is that you can build standards that you're going to build off of. You know, all like I started using like REM scale typography because I want to make sure that if I am going from mobile to mobile web to mobile app, that the fonts have a scaling structure. But there's still sometimes I do a, a traditional H tags, you know, where it's just I have six and that's where it was. And if I scale down, my H1s become H2s, my H2s become H3s because I want it to feel a certain way from end to end. And as for me, it's always making things feel like they belong together. Right. And I think that's such an important part for our entire job. So once you start getting all these best practices for yourself, like I, I love, um, oh my God, what's the name of the plugin for, for Chrome, uh, Mobin, um, uh, Muesli. Like if you ever, it's a M U M U Z L I. It's a plugin for Chrome. Once you open up your Chrome window, it gives you like just images and you could choose what kind of images you want. You know, like my job is working in a no code platform now. So we're working in a lot of like uh, dashboard style stuff. So it's not like the super sexy work that I see in Muesli, but color schemes, typography, you know, use of illustrations, illustration. Oh God, illustrations and animations for yourself. Please build a library of them, build places to find them. Like as a UI designer, I think motion is such a, big part of our uh, big part of our career, right? Like it's, uh, it's the evolution. Our job goes from flat static images to now being able to introduce video, introduce micro animations, introduce all the little things that make it feel engaging. You know, that's why there's no slides here because I want you guys to be engaged because you're going to see a cartoon character bounce up and down. Like that's, that's what gets, users engaged you know if we're doing a uh, an onboarding flow super fucking boring 
you got a new credit card. We're going to give you four slides to let you know of the things you're going to get and what you're going to have to sign into your account, bringing a little life to it. You know, I worked uh, on a project for Wells Fargo and we were, we did these little animations of like super, just super simple, just little pulsing images, like, um, you know, save money when you travel. It's like a, a plane with a, uh, money behind it. Um, you know, it just creates a little bit of fun stuff. You know, it's just, it's just a little bit of extra. And if you haven't guessed, I'm always extra. Um, but that's the thing, right? Like it just, it, it's visual cues, you know, any type of, so going back, my favorite, when the internet was in the beginnings and we didn't have high speed internet everywhere, um, movie trailers. Now we can watch movie trailers literally anywhere. But when it was launched on a site, websites would have it, their entire hero space was the trailer and it said, play trailer. We had to wait forever to pay for it to load, but it was always so worth it. Now, as we build brands and we have, um, we have the, the availability of this content, like use it. Like if you, one of the things that drove me nuts working for some companies is they would do this beautiful ad campaign. And then I'd be like, okay, can I get that video to build into a hero space? No. What? Well, you know, it's not meant for web. Pretty sure it's on YouTube. <laughs> meant for web. Like sometimes the mentality, this is where our job is like, so what we do is tell the story. You guys, if you end up researching me, you're going to find a fucking whole shit tone art of storytelling story stuff that I love talking about. When we start a page, if you're doing an ad campaign and you have this beautiful piece of video that's ready for the world and you want them to see it, we can use it as a background mm. with like a 70% like black shade over it, moving and, and, and bringing to life because you want people to click on it. You know, the ideas of these like view trailer nows from like the 90s and early 2000s, that's still what we do today. You know, when I see, when I go to a, a, a site and I get to see something moving in the background, I automatically want to click on it. I'm like, what is it going to be? You know, when you, when you see uh, an about a company, you know, as, people who design pages for, uh, for companies in general, the about page has become so important because let's be serious. I'm going to go on a little tangent. If you haven't noticed, we're all tangents. Um, when you look for a job, on top of it being like a company you want to work for, it's their mission. It's about who they want to be. How do you evoke that story? Like using generic pictures of people at a picnic? Great. You know, one of the things that um, I loved at a company I used to work for was they did like little testimonial videos. It was about the people who work there. Granted, I don't work there anymore. I think they still have my video up there, which that's fucking mad awkward. But it was about me, about what I love, about what I love about design. You know, when you look for a company and they have content on there, isn't that good to see? And this is from us, from a UI standpoint. When we're building a visual design, we have to say, how do we, how do we build? How do we how do we tell a story? What do we what assets do we have? What assets can we create? Because also, I don't want anybody here to ever think that you are stuck using the assets that are readily available to you. If you have an idea, if you want to create fucking anything, you want photography to look a certain way, tell them. Stock photography, tons of stock photography out there. Some of them hit the right well ways to kind of hit, you know, the emotion you're trying to get, but nothing is like what's really there. Um, I just heard Nigeria will no longer uh, use photography for clothing brands that are not of the people of Nigeria. Like how that makes just complete sense. Like <laughs> you're going to show clothing for people. Like how many blonde hair, blue haired white models were in that clothing for Nigeria? And I saw tons of people from Nigeria here. Tell me, right? Like, that's not, that, that's not going to speak to you. From a UX standpoint, from a UI standpoint, these things don't speak to the people who they are going to. Quick question about colorblind. I am. Red, green. 
Uh, I have been my whole life, obviously. Uh, being a designer has not been easy, um, but you learn. I took color theory classes in college. No surprise, didn't do well. That's how I actually found out that I was like really, really deeply red, green, colorblind. Um, originally, for graphic design, I had the Pantone book. For anybody who is old and understands what a Pantone book is, I memorized a series of colors from start to finish. I know what colors were my reds, what colors were my greens, where they learned. It was tough, and I constantly had to ask people for help, but I got there. I would tab them a lot too. My books had post-it notes were always a big part of my life. Now, as a designer in mobile, I know what the spectrum looks like. So unless I, when I have to create color, totally different thing, always gets ran by somebody because there was a small little gap of my career when I was making a lot of men's bikes that I thought were blue, but really were purple. Uh, and I would just be like, oh man, the printer didn't work. It must be low on toner. And the boss would be like, all right, cool. And I'd be like, sweet. Fuck. And I'm texting my designers because I might make all those bikes blue. And they look, they're like, you didn't, you didn't know again. Yeah, I didn't. So I think that's, um, Kathy, I still have mine too. Uh, it looks like hell. And I don't think the colors are anywhere accurate. Anton book from 96. Uh, but that's the thing, right? I think when you start to, you, this goes back to that accessibility thing and how you never let anything stop you, right? I was always an artist. I always drew. Little did I know all my colors were wrong. Go figure. Um, I, but, I also be a superpower in a way. You don't have to use plugins to figure out if your designs are accessible. If you think it's accessible, it is. Oh, yeah. Half the world. I legit, when I was at uh, Havas, New York, uh, there were many things. Um, that, that I would see a deck and I'd be like, oh, this is a, is there something going here? Cause this is just a picture of a wall. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, Joe, there's a logo on there. And I'm like, well, no, there's not. And then I, then, but this goes back to the whole education of what we do, right? We have to tell people one in eight men are colorblind. That is a very tight percentage of people. Um, and if we're, you know, looking to personas on who we're trying to send design to, you know, there was this whole big joke years and years ago about the NFL. Uh, they used to do Thursday color rush games. So it was the Bills and the Jets. I'm a big Jet fan. Uh, there's a Jet football behind me. Uh, they put the Jets in head to toe green and the Bills head to toe red on a green field. Guess who didn't know what the fuck was going on? Oh, oh I was just look, I would look at numbers. I would look at helmets. I knew when they had possession. If I turned around for a second to get a beer and I came back, I'd be like, why is my guy tackling our own guy? It's, it was very frustrating. It became like a big joke and then opened up the conversation. Right. The NFL is primarily a male dominated like sport that people watch, you know, and you don't think about this. <laughs> Usually home and away jerseys are white. Do them head to toe white, uh, but that's a whole other thing. So uh, I think that we have a lot of great questions in here and I'm gonna to try to keep up with them as much as possible. Um, so I think that's part of the thing, right? Like, and, and this is where we're here. We're all here today. We are all part of a community. The community has changed dramatically in the last 22 years that I've been alive. There used to be a thing where designers, we all thought we were in competition together. Like, that's not healthy. Like, there were designers that wouldn't help you because if you did better, then they won't get a promotion. It's not like that anymore. We're a fucking family. We're here to work together. We're here to make sure, because also we know this network is extremely small. You know, if I find out that you're an asshole, somebody else is going to find out you're an asshole. So there's no reason to be an asshole. It's all here to be together and build things together. So that's why places like Dribble are great. This is why communities like, like everywhere. You join Discord channels, 
you join Slack channels, you show off your work. Never be afraid to show off your work. If people have negative things to say, they have ne negative things to say. The internet's gonna internet. Um, but maybe you'll get good feedback. Maybe you'll get constructive feedback like, hey, I review portfolios all the time. I had to tell somebody the other day, like, listen, I really, really like this, but you know, there's a little bit of accessibility stuff that you can kind of drop in here. There's a little bit of storytelling stuff, like uh, the order of how things were in a, in, in a story. I said, listen, you talked about the design system at the end, but you already showed the visual design. I start up with that, with that design system. Talk about that design system. Talk about the iteration. Talk about the ideas and everything that came with it and how that applies. You know, it's, and it, none of this is meant to be is meant to be negative. And I think that's where, you know, I've luckily had amazing people around me that have always been whenever I've done something stupid and be like, oh, how does this look? I know that I'm going to get like real criticism, not like, oh, it looks great. Good job. Don't do fucking anybody any good. I won't be told unless you really think it's great. That's fine. But odds are you're going to find something wrong. You know? Uh, like me, I built that fucking slide and realized that the line wasn't straight. And I did that, drive me nuts. Um, so when we start working with our clients, right, as we take all of our values and all the things we've learned and all the things we've done, and we have this process that we have in place for ourselves, it's a, it's a lockstep to doing it in a professional setting. If you're so used to doing things a certain way, and it goes the same way of like, I, we're not all marathon runners. There may be marathon runners in, in the mix, but if you train for yourself and you train to be a runner, then you can run in a race. You know, we train at home to be a good designer. We read books. We read. Uh, we we understand how we do. We understand what we do. We understand our job. When we go to the professional setting, that's the prime time. That's where we apply everything we've learned. When you do a boot camp and you take your first job, on the job training, just going to tell you. But how do you take all that and push it forward, you know, and get better? The idea of perfection, perfectionism, nothing's perfect. None of us are perfect. Our work is never going to be perfect. You know, like the methodologies that I have ingrained in myself that nothing leaves my desk because of design, print design. Print design was terrifying. The second you let go of a file and send it to a printer, if there's a misstep, if there's a mis, uh, misprint, colors are off, the second it gets printed, you have 5,000 uh, 5, catalogs that say hop instead of hope. Yeah, and guess, who, guess who's the only person who fucking recognizes that? For, when, you're taking, when you're doing digital design, now we're at the point that we're doing flexible. You know, you hand off, you hand off a file to developers, you, you learn how a developer wants to hand files off because this is a whole big part of our job. You know, like when we go back to when we're done with our design and we got everything locked in in our design system that influences how we build off the wireframes and how we constantly create and we bring new imagery in and we bring new animations and all this shit. And then you meet with a developer and you say, hey, here's the file. As I'm, as you're, oh, by the way, as you're designing, as you're creating anything new, talk to the developer. Hey, I have this great idea. Can we do it? Because the last thing they want to see is something done. Them being like, "Are you out of your mind? You make JavaScripts we have to load?" And I'll be like, "None, no, Joe, tons. All right, great." Because that's all. That's also the part of this. Like, this is the team, right? From if you're in a, an organization that you have a UX designer, you have a UI designer, you have a developer, and then product people and everybody else running around conversations you're all remember no matter what our job is it's a relationship you're going to need to understand how a ux designer is building their wireframes how you're going to apply a ui to their wireframes and how a developer is going to understand how what needs to be built and how it's going to look constantly talk to each other go out drinking together have weird virtual happy hours i don't know whatever you have to do to build that relationship because that constantly moves you around right that constantly helps you understand how you're going to be good and great at your job, but never perfect. Because perfect is fucking unattainable. Um, some idea me about staying motivated to learn anything new. This is going to sound very stupid, 
and but naturally it's just coming from me. Um, there should be no reason not to stay motivated. This world is constantly changing. There's new problems to solve. I saw somebody else right in here. Design is way bigger than solving problems. There's always going to be something. There's always going to be new areas to to play around in. Like without using you know Star Trek references, but like don't like where are we going to go next? Where can we go? Where can we explore? What are we going to do? Like, what do we, uh, you know, see next? You know, think about it. Before the iPhone came out, I was more worried about how a regular website was going to look like. I saw the iPhone and I was like, oh, our site's not going to look good. And we built for that. Then the screen size gets bigger. And we went from like, you know, 320 to 375. And we have Android screens and iPhone screens and how those are different. And then we have TV. You know, how are we building for Roku and Apple TV? And, you know, we have AR and VR. We have game systems. We have so much shit that we can build for. And it's constantly going to change. It's going to be something that we could constantly sink our teeth into. You know, we have tools that allow us to be creative, like outside of Figma and XD and all that stuff. We have iPads. We have tablets. To be fair, I have a shit ton of sketchbooks still around here because I can't not draw stuff out. You know, when I'm writing my case studies, I still handwrite them and then apply them back. It's the, the motivation is always out there. You should be inspired by everything you see. Like I said before, it's like it's that good inspiration, like even down to um, just built a new desk chair. Like I put it together and I was like, oh, shit. This goes together surprisingly easy. I remember putting one chair together. It took me forever. And I got my hand caught trying to put a wheel on. Um, this, oh, where is it? The Nintendo that we talked about before. Wrong hand. There you go. I don't know why I'm not better at this. I should know where mirroring goes. A marvel at how they built the rotating screen inside the TV. If you, if you, if you haven't seen it, Google it. It's fucking crazy. It's like an old school animation style where you crank it and the whole thing spins around. But it goes. You know, after I was, when I was building it, I'm like, nah, this isn't going to work like this. Nah, this isn't going to work. What the fuck? Boom. Oh, shit. This is cool. You know, like, it's, it's so amazing. You know, like how we have the ability to keep building inside apps. Like, how do we keep pushing the platforms? How do we keep pushing engagement? How do we keep pushing tools that help people? You know, one, the reason why I bought this desk chair, because I used Amazon a AR. I took a step back. Dropped the chair in the room. I was like, huh, looks nice. You know, like, uh, play around with them. Play around with, uh, oh, my God, what's the name of the Adobe software that you can drop in stop? The super easy. My brain is not working. Which one? Arrow? Yes, Arrow. Yes. Adobe Arrow. You could drop Photoshop files in there. You could drop, like, you could create art. You know, if you're in here because it's a UI conversation, you're creative. You know, not that I'm saying nobody else is creative, but like there's a level of creativity that's different here. You know, I've, uh, I think there's so much to build. And I think it's, it gives us the opportunity. Like uh, one of the things that I, I've realized now is that we don't get pigeonholed as much as we did in the previous years. If you were a print designer, you were a print designer. If you designed just ads, you were an advertising print designer. If you're a branding designer, you're just a branding designer. Now it's just like for, for years in my career, I learned that uh, I couldn't get a job in healthcare because I've never worked in healthcare. I can't get a job in agency because I never worked in an agency. Can't get a job in pharma because I never worked in pharma. You've just worked in, you know, in-house. Can't work in an agency. That shit is gone now. If you know your job and you know how to do it and you know how to do it well, you can do anything. Nobody's saying you don't have this experience anymore. Because we know no matter what, you're going to be doing the research to figure out what you need to do. Um, I think there's obviously so, th so many things about, um, about like, you know, uh, understanding compliance and all that shit when it comes to like banks and all that stuff. But to be fair, I went from working, I was a creative director for a bicycle company. I worked for IBM. Those two aren't the same. And then worked at Amex, financial services with zero financial services experience. Figured it out, right? 
it's that's our job. It's still design. It's still understanding and, and creating and doing all the fun shit that comes with it. And <laughs> an amazing question. How do you not get overwhelmed with everything that's going on? How do you take it in stride? How do you uh, constantly motivate yourself to do more? How do you constantly stay up, stay up to date on stuff? So we have a full-time job, right? We have our nine to five or <laughs> nine to seven or eight to seven, depending on what day you're playing. We have the ability to take off freelance work. That's the beauty of our job. Make some extra money, but build some cool shit. Push yourself to try new things. Or there's got to be stuff that you've wanted to try, right? Like, for the longest time, I had people tell me, um, hey, you have no mobile app experience. And I'm like, what do you mean? I built four of them. And they're like, well, they're not in your portfolio. I'm like, because they haven't launched yet. I can't post them yet because I'm under NDAs. You want to see them? By the way, you could always do this. If I happen to, if you want to see them, we'll be on a call together. Maybe it'll be on my screen. I didn't say nothing. Uh, but that's the thing is it's, you know, I do these things because I get fucking excited about it. Right? Like I want to build, uh, I want to build beautiful experiences for people. I want to help friends out who have great ideas. And maybe help friends out that have not so great ideas because everybody's got one. You know, it's like, how do you do that? You know, when you're building, when you're going through your process and you're, the best part is the, the process you have built for yourself, process we talked about in the beginning, the process of understanding what you're doing and constantly staying up with it. You can, it becomes like a part of you and you pick up a freelance job, you say, all right, so all the stuff I know goes here now. All the stuff I know gets applied here now. Like I want, uh, years ago, I went to this whole, um, I went to a talk that was design thinking your life. It was very interesting. Not what I expected. It was good, it was fun, but it was understanding how the process, the process we put together of understanding iteration and creation you know, how that applies to your world. Like when you go shopping, if you're going to go shopping, what do you do? You create a shopping list because you're trying to figure out what you're going to make for the week. So you have to think about it. You have to sit back and go, all right, so I want to make these meals. I want to do these things. And then when you go to the supermarket, you always end up getting ice cream and chips, even though you didn't have. List. So how does that work? You know, like, so I think these principles are so easy to be built into us that you can apply it to so many stuff. Like when you're, and then when you go to a job, you apply them at a job. When you become a leader, a totally other realm. Like how do you apply everything you know and learn to the people that you're trying to teach, the people you're going to mentor and you're going to lift up? So the question about the metaverse, this is one of the most insane things that I'm constantly racking my brain around. One of my very good friends, uh, Sonia Sanderson, she's on ADP list. Uh, she is the founder of Upworlds. She, I talk to her about what she does. It is insane. Like I think about how we do UX and UI now. How do we bring that to a space that's massive? Right? Like there's no end. The screen, we have an end. <laughs> if it's a long scroll, eventually we'll get tired. But like when you have a, when you have a headset on and you're just roaming, like, how do you create user uh, engaging experiences? You know, like I'm, I'm constantly asking myself, like, what's AR going to be like? We all hear about the goggles that are coming out that are going to be from Google. Google's already had the Google Glass that came and went. Apple's going to release lenses. The future maybe be contact lenses. Who knows? How does that work? You know, like, and these are the beautiful things. This is also why I love our industry now. You can literally type in anything into a Google search and find a concept for it. Like before every new operating system for a, a computer or a phone or anything comes out, there's somebody who's got an idea. There's somebody who has a beautifully well-crafted design. Some of it in these amazing 3D images and stuff that I'm just like, oh, God, you do that. I want to do that. Constantly, I say that all day long. You know, like, how does that all come to play? 
you know, and you get, again, the inspiration, you see it and you're just like, oh man, it's really cool. I saw, um, what was it? A bunch of renderings of people putting screens on like AirPods, like little like screens on the back. And I'm like, that seems moderately useless, but not necessarily not cool. You know, like how, how you use your, if you have an Apple watch or you have Google Wear or you have anything like that, like how does that, how does that OS work? Like how do people keep evolving on it? You know, I saw some wacky things of like modules that you can put your watch into that has a camera on it. By the way, this is not a good angle for me. <laughs> right? Like uh, nobody, there's nobody's good angle. And then what, when you stop talking, it just goes down. Like you just got to stand there the whole time. But then again, FaceTime, you know? So that's the thing, right? So it's like constantly looking at things. I'm always all day long. You know, I'm sure everybody in the last two years has looked at Zoom and was like, why do their icons look like they were pulled from Microsoft Office? Why have they not updated any of the design? Why is it still the same? Why is their main update? Hey, we added reactions. Because when you're the person who doesn't want to be on camera, you could still go. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's weird stuff. And this is where like constantly from a UX and UI standpoint, how do you make this more engaging? Like if I did want to show slides, then you don't see me. I'm not a person. I'm just a slide and a loud voice behind it that curses too much. Why is there nothing like a newscaster where I can have slides like right over my shoulder and like an AR experience, the way they do the backgrounds? You know, not that I'm talking directly to Zoom that they're even here. Like, why are you not doing cool shit like that? Like, right? Like, that's the thing. Like, where does this, where does this meet? Where does the rubber meet the road when it comes to an experience? I think this is, uh, it's part of our job. So like, I know we kind of went off track a thousand different ways, which is totally fine, but building UIs, right? Building this process, building this inspiration, building this funnel. You know, one of the things, if you're a young designer or you're in a boot camp or just got out of the boot camp and you hear people go, oh my, you know, you have, don't have enough work in your portfolio. It started off when we were in college, same shit. I left college with a bunch of projects I did in college and random shit I did for the neighborhood, right? Like none of it was um, shit to work. It was all stuff that just happened. So it's that whole conversation, you know, how do you build stuff? If you see stuff that you don't like, you think things need a, an uplift or it could be look better, it can work better or anything else, Make it happen. Like build a case study around it. Be creative. See shit that you don't like and say like, this needs to be better. If any of you, uh, I know there's a lot of people from all over the world, but if you're uh, in the US and you ever went to Disneyland, their app is so bad. It's Disney. Why? How could they hmm, have the whole MCU now in your, in your hands, but you make a shit app. Like, how do you make it better for people who are in a stressful situation of being at a theme park, which should be fun, but you have four kids that are running around and a husband who's sweating his ass off. And, you know, like the last thing you want to do is like search for an hour, how to make a reservation for lunch. You know, how does the UI feel that way? I saw something that uh, I was doing research for a trucking company for their app. And I came across a company called Sam Sarah. Their app for their drivers is the most ugliest fucking thing in the world. It's just boxes of color. And the reason why is, much to the fact that it might not be the most legal or normal thing that you should do, they know a lot of truck drivers are on the road, so they want to make the buttons easy to click into. So from a UX, stand from a UX standpoint, it makes complete sense. From a UI standpoint, I'm like, cringe for days. So... Like in my mind, how would I make that better? How would I make it that it's hands free? Terrifying. Um, There's something that you mentioned in the beginning saying something can be a bad inspiration and a good inspiration. So how, how would someone differentiate what's good and bad? Good question. Because as we know, design is always objective. So I think it's... Uh, there's two ways to identify bad design. One is obviously something that 
just looks horrendous. We all have probably seen that website for the used cars uh, where it's fucking a bunch of flashy shit and all this stuff going on. For me, design, like any type of art, tells a story. If you interact with something or see something and it, and it feels, and it sounds funny to say this, but it feels right. Mm. You know, when you look at websites and they feel like, like it's like you're walking into a space when you're feeling something that feels very welcoming or feels very like engaging, you know, e the biggest violator of bad UX and UI, because that's a code people still haven't been able to crack. Amazon, their design has not changed for quite a while. We're still not sure from a whole how it works, but, um, Please excuse the construction that's going on in the background. Apparently, guys are coming to stand up for today. Um, I think for me, it's always been that thing of how I look at things, how it works, how it how it relates back. Like um, going back to the, the example of like the healthcare. If they do this like dark blue, or they do this like uh, this feeling of like heaviness. You know, going back to the idea of color evoking emotion. You know, that's not the best design. Something that doesn't feel like it works. You know, animations for the sake of animations. Like we've all seen going back to the whole thing of, um, let me close my door a little bit. Hopefully, hopefully that helps. And I hope that didn't give you enough time to try to identify all the shit behind me. That's very <laughs> um, You know, and I think it goes back to like looking at whenever you have to do an audit, as like a designer and you do an audit for a system or a site and you look my favorite doing an audit and finding one company has 23 different style buttons why the answer is usually like this company did this one this one did this one marketing came up with this one these are legacy um you're like Nobody noticed that this had bevels and embosses around it, like it was from the original iPhone. Like, what is going on? Um, so I think that's the thing. I think when you look at, and, and somebody wrote it here, like, yeah, they got into design because bad design, and they and they know why it's bad. Because when you see bad design or you interact with something that's not great, like you want to fix it. When you have that drive to want to fix things, because if it aggravates you. I don't know how many people use HBO Max. HBO Max was uh, is touted as the app built for people who don't want to have a good experience, but they have Game of Thrones now, so we deal. Um, because they want to do the things that they've learned, right? Like Netflix, big images, swipeable fucking menus back and forth. But it's, if it's not put together right, like that's something that you'll no notice a lot. It's a lot of great pieces. It's not together. Right. You're like, oh, why? Why is this? Why is this doing this? You know, I'm clicking on. Um, I just had a conversation recently about. Uh, I built a navigation, right? And it was a wireframe, so I didn't have the arrows in to show what was the drop down. But we talked to them about which one's a drop down, and we said this is going to be a drop down. And somebody was like, Do you think people will know? That that's a drop down. I said, well, no, once we get into like the visual design aspect, I'm gonna get some like iconography. I'm like, just for this, we're just trying to show the, the content hierarchy. So people do realize right. like this, this isn't right. This is like an, an ex, uh, like a project person. Like it wasn't even like a designer or anybody. They just were just like, I don't think people are gonna like that. And I was like, oh shit. Yeah, they're not, because we're not telling them what's going on. Um so I think that's part of it, you know, like, uh, there's a question here about doing a boot camp, right? Like, mm -hmm. so I say any education is good education. Certain people are not school people. Certain people are learn on their own people. You know, I just so happened to have like a natural progression of things. But then there was a point that like, if there was boot camps at the time, I probably would have taken one because terminology was a big part of it. Like there was a lot of times early on in my, in my like UX UI career 
that I just kind of sat back and I was like just smiling and nodding and Googling whatever somebody say. Product roadmap. All right. Oh, yeah. No, we absolutely have that on the roadmap. Yeah. You know, like, and that's the thing where I kind of wish, like, I don't have regrets in life many outside of like uh, being, get, eating too much bread. But it's the idea of understanding, you know, like, that's why this is a constant, this is a constant learning, constant trajectory, constant growth. You know, like, constantly reading books on UX Collective constantly. You know, um, the one thing that I missed from being uh, commuting into work every day to now being at home is that part of my routine in the morning was going and reading design articles. Now I'm just more of like, let's make breakfast. Let's go for a run. Let's hang out outside. You know, Marguerite is in the morning. Um, and it's the way of, I need to get back into it. I, I end up just buying books and reading them when I can, you know? Watching videos, tons of content, tons of content. I think you know, like how you mentioned the structure that you need to have when you start designing. I think beginning at the beginning, you don't really have a structure. You don't have someone to follow to have a structure. So I guess in that sense, a boot camp helps to get you started in the industry. But if you definitely have to build on and keep keep getting updated and inspired, I guess to build oh, yeah. on build your own structure. Because I think you'll go back and there's the sprint book, right? About design sprints and how we do them. It didn't take long for the sprint book to go from a five-day sprint to a four-day sprint to a three-day sprint. So we're constantly evolving. You know, the best thing about the boot camps give you, and this is funny because I had a friend of mine who did the Google boot camp thing and they got, they were like, oh my God, discovery is so intense. You guys do so much work. There are so many things to do. And I was like, yeah, but no, like it does, but it doesn't, you know, like, and the way to explain it is like, uh, the boot camps give you, you leave the boot camp with a toolbox. All the shit you need to know is in a toolbox. Right. And then when you go on the job, you pull out what you need. Right. Oh, we're doing a competitive analysis today. And then we're doing an audit. Are we doing a, are we doing a slot? Maybe. Are we doing personas? Probably not. Like. So I think they're always good. I think they're great to kind of really help you understand. You know, I, I think there's, uh, like I said, this is a total learning trajectory, but getting yourself at the right spot. Like I went to a four year school to learn graphic design. Granted, it was a, a more fine arts driven experience. So I learned a lot about, you know, charcoal drawing, which I'm, I really loved and watercolors, which I didn't know I was gonna love, became my main medium but also becoming a graphic designer. And I would, for starters, I want to be an illustrator. Obviously the shit around me shows that I'm a child. Um, I love to draw, I love to be creative. That's what I wanted to do. But without the structure and understanding of what I needed to do, of what I was going to be good at. I had my, anybody who knows me has heard the story of, um, I went to go into college and I met with the Dean of Students and I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait. I want to be an illustrator. I'll work Marvel and DC and Image Comics. And I want to blah, blah, blah. And he goes, yeah, no. And I was like, what do you mean though? He's like, you're not really uh, an illustrator. Oh. Fuck, we can go down the imposter syndrome rabbit hole all day long. That was my first real like professional like hit of imposter syndrome. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, you got too much personality to be an illustrator. The fuck does that mean? He goes, be a graphic designer. I'm like, well, what's that? And he's like, computer graphics. I'm like, I have a computer. He goes, buy one. And I'm like, I have money. I want to spend money to come to the school. He's like, steal one. Eventually I did. It was, but it was that thing of not knowing. Right. You know, I was, I was terrified. I got to my first day of school and I went in and I was like, the guy's like, open up Photoshop. And I'm like, oh, fuck, what's Photoshop? And then I see everybody else's screens have like the little, because iOS, Mac OS 9.2.2, going a ways back, had like a window that all your apps were in. There was no dock at the time. I know, the dark times. Um, it was also powered by candlelight. Uh, but it was... I, I didn't know where it was. It was a collapsible 
menu. And once you opened it, all the apps were there. So I clicked on the app, Photoshop opens up. We start talking through Photoshop. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. And that was the start of when I fell in love with design. And then I learned how the apps worked. I learned that I'm doing vector art in this one. I'm doing layout work in this one. I'm building graphics. Back then, it was just, it was GIFs, um, not SVGs. So they did not look the best. So as I build illustrations and icons for websites, I would do this and do that and do this. So I got this ed education naturally because I was paying for it. But like, and I took all the baseline, all the stuff that you learn, and then went to work and then was told that I know nothing. <laughs> I can awesome. Uh, but that was the thing. So then it's like when you're at a job, also uh, from the job side, right? And this goes into your overall view of your career. Always be curious. The ABC. If it used to be always be closing, always be curious. Always ask questions. Never feel like any question you ask is the wrong question. If you work in a big organization, an enterprise organization, they're going to throw acronyms at you so much that you're just going to be like, what the fuck do those three letters mean? What is that? How? Why, why do you guys just talk in code? You know, like it's, it's fascinating. So like, it's always keep, always ask questions, always, uh, you know, take advantage of organizations that will help you learn things. Um, ask people at work. Uh, it was, it's always fascinating because people will be like, I had, I had a designer ask me a question once and I just responded back on Slack, no idea. And she came back and she goes, how do you not know? And I'm like, this is a new term they just made up. Because, you know, it's, and then I asked, I was like, hey, by the way, what are you talking about? Obviously, I'm going to let you know that's my approach. I always be a little more nicer, probably a little more respectful. Uh, there is a lot of me going like, the fuck? And they're just like, uh, Joe, yeah. All right, yeah, I'll pull it together. So I think that's the thing is like, because then you take everything, because there's also, because the world we live in and there's no real standards, um, what you learn at one job, some of it is transferable to the next. Some of it, they use a different terminology. You know, it's, it's just who's running it and how they do it. And uh, I think it's, it's interesting, to say the least, but it always keeps us on our toes. Mm -hmm. uh, I... I think one of the things that when we're presenting work, well, actually, I'm that, two things when presenting work. Um, one, I always say, know your audience, right? Like this goes without saying. Like if you're, if you're pitching to a client and the client is uh, senior, senior management or executives and all that shit, don't be too technical, you know? I, my thing is making things relatable because I'm sure we've all been in meetings where people are talking to you and you're just like, I don't know what the hell is going on right now. What are they saying? Why, why are none of these words English? Like why are none of these words, why are none of these words make sense in a sense? What's going on? Like, I never want anybody to feel that way when I'm talking. So it's always something easy, relatable. You get to the point, you make your points. You know, if you're talking to, um, other designers, then be technical as much as you want. Hell, use every acronym you want to use. Talk about how you're doing, you know, uh, what type of animations you used in Figma and ease in and ease outs on the smart animates, you know, like that's the point. That's where you, that's where you dive in, you know? So I think it's, it's always knowing where you want to go. So I've had some people go like, oh, can you be more technical? Yeah, you want me to be more technical? Absolutely. I am ready for it. Um, but I think it's uh, it's just it's always that way of presenting. Like as we present work, even when it comes to like, so we're going to go into the the deep dive of selling design in general, because despite our best efforts, everyone thinks it's magic. You have just, you were all wizards. This is Hogwarts. Like everybody thinks we just wave a magic wand tool 
and bam, there's a design that happens. It's not the case. It takes time. Everything takes time. And I think as we, the question came up around um, the importance of usability testing in general, this always goes back to um, the company I'm at now, they have a process, engineering central, not really UX, but what ended up happening is I said, I went and did the research, they're spending at the end of the project, engineers are spending, uh, I think an extra four weeks, four to six weeks, refactoring code, rebuilding experiences, redoing, redoing, redoing. I said originally, hey, I'd love to do a four to six week discovery at the front end and get all the right information. Oh man, that is too much time. That you, We can't do that. That's gonna delay the entire project. So then I found out that fucking, you've been sitting there the whole time. You've, you've, been, you've been wasting it. You can make it constructive. So as, it, as the design gets started, it's thought through, it's created, it's right. Then as it goes down the line, the engineers are set. They are ready to build. Zero problems, zero issues, zero anything. You know, it's, it's all about open communication and realistic communication. You know, bringing in testing into a scenario. Like, I am, I'm not going to say passive aggressive, um, but, like, I'll constantly say, you know, like, man, this would have been so much different if we did user testing. You know how much time we could have saved? You know what we could have done? Oh. <laughs> magic. Uh, but that's the thing. It's the education, right? So I, I just, I don't know why I get away with the shit I say. It just happens. But it's like that thing, right? Like, it's, it's all about telling people. It's all about them saying, you know, build it right. You know, would you ever want to stand on a platform that somebody didn't think through how it was supported? Let's just do it quick. It's fine. Just put two sticks, bar on top, a couple plates. That's fine. You don't have to worry about weight ratio or nothing. No. No. It has to be thought through. You know, like, um, again, going back to Legos, naturally. If there's a Legos idea area where people, everyday people, create Lego sets out of the shit they find, and using, just using, again, using the design system, using the, the tools that are available, right? And they built amazing things. If you ever look at it, there is such cool stuff there. And the idea is like people vote on them and then they become real. That's why we have like a Nintendo and, my, and a Seinfeld and everything else. Like, it's all because people create it. You know, so it's like, uh, it's the same thing. Like we have to validate, we have to create things. You know, like even when you're in an ecosystem, like one of the things I love to have time to do inside an organization is um, downtime. It doesn't happen often, but when it does, we are gonna be creative as fuck. Um, because I, I try not to have design debt. I work design debt into like our regular everyday work. That's a whole, that's a whole, that's a day for another talk. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's using the time correctly. We see an experience, we have an experience. How can we make it better? You know, using inspiration. I, I love the, I, the Slack channel I build out for every company I work for is just a dump, a design dump. You see something cool, drop it in. You see an article, drop it in. You're inspired by something, drop it in. I want to see it. I want others to see it. I introduced, uh, at Amex, I had designers and engineers and product people all in the same channel. Or I just called it fun shit. I'm really, I'm not a copywriter. Um, but it was. It was people dropping in everywhere. All different ideas. Hey, I'd love to use this module. Hey, can we do parallax animations? Hey, can we do this? Like you know inspiration everywhere right so communicating it as well just talking to people in your community opens up 10 times more of inspiration on a daily basis and oh, yeah and i think you've covered an extremely large ground and people are dming a load of questions and i think we can open it up to the audience to ask you questions directly if, if that's yeah cool. absolutely yeah. Who, who so wants to your hand in we can 
Anyone? Anyone in the group? Anyone want to take themselves off mute and actually? Okay, yes, we have someone. Sweet. I'm not sure how to pronounce. Mika, Mika. Mika. Please unmute. Yeah, I've, I've heard both Mika and Mika, so I'm cool with either one. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask if you had to. Uh, I have to ask, is Outlaw your real last name? For sure, man. <laughs> oh, that is fucking badass. <laughs> you are like, uh, in a professional setting, people will be like, Mr. Outlaw. <laughs> I was I was going to say that. That is, that is, I love it. That's fine. Yeah, All right. Man. Been getting that reaction since I was little. <laughs> that's, that's great. Oh my god. Yeah. Then you have little outlaws. Oh shit. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. So, uh, in general. So I was curious. I know we was talking about earlier about you say you went to a four year school for graphic design and there's boot camps and you're self learning. If you personally had to start over but you were still kind of had all the knowledge that you gained to this point, how would you personally go about uh, re-entering the field? Oh, fuck. Uh, I, would I, I would absolutely join a boot camp, without a doubt. I think it's, they're, they're available, right? Like, I think that's the biggest part. You don't have to go in for it. Um, and this happens so... This is, a, this is a great question because one of the things that I have a lot of people in my life who are old graph designers that went out and went and had kids or, you know, took a job and stayed there for a while and it just wasn't, you know, it's starting to get like lame as shit and they want to try something new. I'm like, just take a boot camp. I'm like, get in a boot camp, learn a bunch of stuff that you need to learn, learn the terminology, learn the bits and pieces. And they all go, can't you teach me? I'm like, bro, I ain't got time for that. But it's true, right? Like it's, these things are here. It's all education. And what a lot of them do is they set you up, right? Like they set you up for success. And then it's up to you to continue to, um, uh, you to continue to move with it. So I think that's where it's, uh, it's such a great resource to have. And it's something that we, uh, we have just so readily available. And if I had to start over, if I was at the point of just being a graphic designer and then realized I had to get into UX, I'd be like, I, you know, I need it. I need, I need to know how to do it. You know, there's, uh, even still to this day, sometimes I'm like, maybe I should take a boot camp for something. Maybe I'll take an AR boot camp. you know, take a VR boot camp and figure out how to build. You know, I think it's just, uh, we're just too, like, I hate using the term God. I'm going to hate myself in the future for this. We're so blessed that all of this is available. Right. And there's so many great reasons. We have this, we can do this. We can talk. You know, I think it's, I think it's definitely a way to go. I think a, a bug just flied into my ear, flew into my ear. English is great. Um, trust, what you got? Um, so I want to, you've um, spoken about um, like the process which you um, go through before bringing out design. I did ask the question in the chat, but I wanted like maybe just a straightforward, like from stakeholder meeting to developer handoff, like how do you, come, I mean, when you're designing, like maybe for a design gig, not for a single product per se, but like maybe a design gig, someone gives you like the idea of what they want for the design. How do you um, go from that meeting to develop and what do you do? Uh, that's a whole set of process. So I love, thank you for following up on that. I did see it and I was like, I was reading it and I'm like, oh, that's a good one. And then we went to like actual real questions. So perfect timing. So working with stakeholders in general, it's, it's rough, right? Like sometimes they're like super competitive, they're super into it and they wanna talk more and they wanna be super engaged and sometimes they're very hands off. So this also brings up like two different other questions of like handing off to your development team or handing off to their development team. No matter what, it always goes back to communication. You know, from the start, whenever I have a developer on a project, I legit, um, like, meet them and say, like, and then this, and again, this is an old trick from being a print designer. If I had a printer that I was going to work with, I need to know how their press works. Not all presses work the same. This one prints more blue. This one prints richer black. So it's, like, how you kind of go about it. Um, so I think it's, it's that way of, like, setting the stage, 
So as you're working with a stakeholder and you're doing, maybe if you have to do stakeholder interviews, you build that process around how you have to work with them and explaining to them every step along the way. And my thing is always, I love making people part of the process. You know, you're, if you're in on this, if you're an information source, if you're a source of truth for what I, who I need to build for, like you're, you're, grab my hand. We're going on a fucking journey. Like you're going to come with me and you're going to learn about why the UX is this way. Why the UI is this way. Asking you about what your expectations are, understanding where you want to go. And then when it comes to that developer handoff, like following that journey of being like, Hey, so here's what we're going to do when we walk when we work with a developer. You know, for me, sometimes stakeholders are just like checking with me every, every week. Let me know what's going on. And that's it. And then some of them are just like, slacking me constantly which is great because i'm like yeah tell me tell me what you want to hear like tell me what you want to know tell me um and i think for a lot of people especially on like the stakeholder and non-tech side they think what we do is so cool which it is so they kind of want to see i love the terminology how the sausage is made um which is a disgusting term but it's still like it's relevant like you want to know the background you want to know what makes things how things work and why the decisions are being made. So I think with the process, it's always taking them by the hand and leading them along with you. So sticking to what you do, but just bring a friend for a journey. And I think, again, again, always comes down to communication. I can't have it at home enough. Like don't ever like show up them with like visual design without showing them UX. And then they're just like, well, what the fuck is this? And you're just like, no, no, no. This is what I came up with. You know, I think it's, there's, there's no, it's never bad to over communicate. That's a good lesson in life. When you have a partner, over communicate shit to them, let them know everything that's going on. You know, tell them how you feel. Like if you're stressed out, even when it comes to work, if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling like there's stuff going on or things aren't working the way you want it to, um, you know, like communicate it out. Do we have any? I saw somebody else came and went. Where'd you go? I saw the hand was up and then he disappeared. <laughs> there he is. There he is. Zakir, do you want to ask your question? Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey. My question is when working in startup companies uh, where there is no team of designers and individually are one or two designers and the bunch of lawyers designing a UI. And there is a lot of time taken by UX research. How can we handle it? So, sorry, they just got really close to my door with the fucking belt sander, which is awesome. Um, so you say you're you have a small team, or you're the only contributor? Yeah, I am only in the team. But how can oh. you manage all processes and pause? So this is this is the roughest thing. So as a designer, right? We go through stages where we take jobs and why, what do they call them? Founding designers now at startups. Like it sounds like a great deal. They give you a good deal on money and you're just like, Oh, it's going to be great. And then all of a sudden it's like chaos around you because you're the one that you could be like an early stage designer and you have to build process around. So whenever I've done that in the past, uh, because I've done this up way more times than I want to admit. I'm a strongish personality, to say the least. Uh, I, I don't settle for shit, right? Like, so when, when we start working and I realize the chaos is there, I say, okay, reset. We need a process in place because not, I had at one point, oh my God, I was getting random emails, Slack messages, and uh, people coming to my desk with requests. I was like, this can't happen. Joe, where's this? I don't know. When did you give this to me? Like I built ticketing systems. Originally I would start to use like Trello and then I would build Jira tickets and then I would start doing intake forms. The intake forms were like my favorite part because I would put required fields in. So like I will not take, I will not take on work unless the fields that are required are, are filled out. And if it's not filled out with the correct information or any information, because someone would just like hand type like nonsense in, it's not getting done. You know, I'm not, I can't, uh, I can't deal with that. I need structure. I need, and I need everybody else to have structure, right? 
So sometimes you'll get a lot of, you'll get kickback. Absolutely. People will be like, oh, we don't need to do this. We don't need this. Yes, we do. Like if you want stuff to get done and it's, and it's sometimes that little le level of humility of being like, listen, I missed this deadline because this was in a Slack message from a week ago. So there was no tracking it. I don't, I do, I'm, I just needed, I thought I needed more content. Apparently he had the content, right? Like, so I think it's just, it's always checks and balances. So I think it's for us as a designer, sometimes we need to be like the one to stand up and be like, we need process. Like, and some people, cause some people also, despite their best efforts, don't know how to work with a designer. That comes up a lot in our careers. Like even in large, large uh, organizations, um, I worked for two large organizations that didn't have UX or UI teams. They outsourced everything to agencies. So once we showed up, they thought it was the same deal, that they would just check in once a month. Right? I'm like, no, you're going to meet with me weekly. I want, I want insight, like, constantly. I want us to talk. Like, I want this to be part of it. Uh-oh, Mike is back. What you got? Uh, one more. This isn't specifically UI request. I mean, uh, specific, but I think I wrote it out. Um, when you were first getting started, how did you go about choosing the projects that you were going to display on your portfolio? I've heard people mention, of course, you want to get real world projects or real world experience, but um, how did you go down that? Like, did you have to choose real world projects? Did you get away with, like you said, maybe finding the Roku app and adding some neat features or twists? Would that work? Or does it definitely have to be like freelance or real world businesses? So for me personally, whenever I'm hiring a designer, I want to see your best work. If, you're, if you have professional work, sweet, have at it. Let me see. If you have an amazing case study around something, that um, that just it, it, that works so well. I want to see. Like I don't care where it's from. I don't care if it's uh, a real project, a fake project, uh, internship, whatever. Like if the work is good, that's all that li literally matters. You know, I think that's and when you display your work, you know, it, we're simple people. As much as I'd love to think that we're way more well, I click on the first thing that's in the left top left. When it comes to case studies, I'd love to be like, oh my God, I look at all of them. No, I click on the first one I see because I assume that's the one you're most proud of because it's the first one in the list. Um, so I think that's a way of going about it. Like I, I actually had an, uh, a discussion with or a corporate recruiter from a bank that will, rename, will remain nameless. Uh, and they said, do you have any mobile apps that are shipped? And I said, currently they are all in development and they will be shipping soon. And she goes, oh, well, this conversation's over then. And I said, excuse me? And she goes, yeah, no, we don't hire anybody unless they ship mobile work. And I said, oh, we are gonna talk about this. So in a very polite way, I said, um, you know a UX UI designer's job is not money management, funding, finding VCs, pitching more, pitching your fucking app out to people. Our job is to research, build, create, and get it ready for development. So anything around that area, that's our job. If it fails, that's not my job. So, and they're like, well, no, that's not how it works. That's not, that's not who we hire here. And I said, you're going to have a shit group of people working for you then because some of the best people are the ones who endure all this nonsense and can deal with all this stuff and have to wait for payments for months at a time because the app lost funding while they were building it and they still have outstanding invoices. Like you're, and I, it's funny because I was on vacation when I took this call and uh, I was not having it because that's so inappropriate to me as somebody who maybe I don't even have a case study around my mobile app because I don't want to fucking write it because I'm fucking too busy and writing case studies is hard and it's fucking a lot of work. Um, and it's not fair to like all of you, right? Like work is work. If you did all the process leading up to the ship, that's all that matters. Oh, they have no ship work. We can't hire them. 
our job is not to is not to get things to the final engineered finish. It's unbelievable. It's crazy. So I would say be creative as much as you can. I think it's it's just amazing that we have this opportunity to do it and fucking have. Um, we got. I'm. Gonna, I think I want to brutalize this name. I'm sorry. Montereo. Hi, Joe. Hi. Thank you so much, and thank you, everyone. It was a really nice session. Although I struggle trying to understand some terms because I am not a designer. Mm. I I only joined because I um I love design, though I don't think it's for me. <laughs> I'm transitioning into product manager. I'm sorry, product management, and I understand that. Um, a lot of product managers have issues sometimes with their designers, you know, developers and other stakeholders. So I just want to ask what has been your experience with product managers? How have you been able to, you know, navigate? And what are the things that you think product managers should know about design that they do not know? How do you think they could, you know, better um, manage their space and their expectations from you seeing that they do not even have the you know technical skills um to know some of the things that you do so how do you think that we could like you know navigate through that those loopholes and you know challenges that product managers usually face with their designers thank you for starters thank you for just being here like that alone is amazing like for everybody that's on the call who's left i don't know why i'm gesturing like i can see you all um this is what everybody should do this is a level of empathy that we all should have for everybody who we work with with everybody we deal with you know these things are great thank you so much for asking the question as well i think it's a, a great fucking question um and the biggest thing i could say in my experience working with product managers and uh senior product people is just be collaborative, right? Like, and ask questions. Like, I think the beauty of our job, the beauty of what we do as a group, as a team, is that everybody's informed. You know, I think um, some of the worst experiences I've had with product managers in my, in my overall, in my years has been people who refuse to learn and who just make demands. Um, I think that's, uh, that's probably just a general, don't be an asshole scenario, uh, but sometimes it happens because some people, you know, uh, what did they say the other day? Uh, I love a good project manager who comes, a product manager who comes to me with an idea. The line is where you show up with a Figma file and say, hey, I did this. And you're just like, no, no. <laughs> But I think it's that way of being collaborative, right? I think our, when we look at our team and we look at what we're doing, you know, you ask the right questions. Like, like I said, show up with inspiration of your own. Like, I, there, there should be no designer that's, that you meet that you show them something you saw and be like, oh my God, this looks so cool. What do you think? And they're going to be like, they think they're a designer now? No. Like, you just saw something that was cool. Like, uh, the engineers are the ones that may be like, yo, we're not building now. We can't be those. <laughs> but I think that's the way. I think it's it always, it's a two-way street with any relationship, right? Like if you have the ecosystem of your team and you're all working together and it's all one level of communication and we're all dealing with the same problems, you know, it's, it, we have to understand what each, what each other do because I know tons of people who don't know what product managers do or product people, they're like, so what is their job? And I'm like, go ask them. I'm like, but start it with, I don't want to be rude, but I want to learn more about what product does. And can you just explain to me some of the stuff you're working on? It's the nice PC way of doing, be like, what do you do all day? <laughs> but I think that's the thing, right? And I think it's, like I said, I, I use the term partnership a lot. I use the term team a lot. I use the term we a lot. That's what we do. You know, when we're in a, a department together, when we're building a product together, we are all part of the same thing. I uh, am amazingly good friends with somebody, my product, director of product, when I was a director of UX and Amex, we are like two peas in a pod because of bound, of bound over trauma. But it's like, uh, 
<laughs> of working on this product, but it's also, we respected what each other did. You know, we had open conversations, you know, like I, I listened to when she vented about uh, design and I vented back to her. And I think that's where it was. It's all mutual respect. We could do a whole hour long talk about respecting the workplace. You know, it's, it's such a simple thing. And this is where it's like, I always joke around, like I've been doing design for 22 years. I've loved my job. There's nothing I'd rather do, but I hate fucking people because people ruin everything. And that's what they do. Like if, this job, our job, our career, everything we do, this is a pleasure. This shouldn't be stressful. This shouldn't be a, a place that we dread going to every day. You know, you should be with people who are empathetic and caring and driven and excited about their work. You know, that's the difference between success and failure. It's not whether you shipped, it's how well you, how well you enjoy what you do. Like you hear this all the time. Right now, Serena Williams is in the U.S. Open. They've, last night, they called her the underdog, which is unbelievable to me. Serena Williams never going to be an underdog. But she's still playing because she loves it. She said last night after she won her match, I'm just having fun. Right? Like, that's the fucking dream. Just have fun. You know, when you do this job, like, the level of empathy you have for your coworkers is the same level of empathy you have for yourself. You know, like... I, I constantly say fuck imposter syndrome. You know, don't let it bother you. Don't let any of this get to you. Go to work every day and enjoy it. Like, yeah, schedules get crazy. Sprints go nuts. You know, sizing projects can be wild. But when it all comes down to it, you know, like how, how great is our job? You know, when you're doing product, like uh, how great is building product? How, how great is strategizing product and building a roadmap and building where we're going to go in three months? Right? Like the best thing about this job is that we're never looking at our feet. We're always looking at our at the horizon. You know, I think that's it's oh, it's fucking amazing. Like it's, this is again, like, and again, 22 years and I'm still like this. This never gets old. I get talk about I've just talked about this for what two hours? Non-stop, unfortunately. You people have been listening to this nonsense for that long. But that's the thing, right? Like, that's why this is so special. That's why if you're just getting started, enjoy this ride. Like, the question of going back to the to square one and what am I going to, what would I be like if I had to start over? I would have no idea what's ahead of me. I wouldn't understand the people I get to meet, the friends I get to make, the work I've gotten to do, the work I'm embarrassed by because design styles have changed so much. Um, you know, and what I'm going to do next. Like, my girlfriend loves to talk about retirement. No, I'll be doing this until like, I'm in my eighties and I'll still be like, what's well, TikTok? When in my day, we had a pandemic where everybody washed boxes. Like this is just, this is, this is just fun. It's just fun. Like, and then you have to enjoy it. You have to enjoy the people you work with. If there's my whole thing is if there's somebody in the organization that's a pain in the ass and they don't follow the same goals that you do, the only thing you do is kill them with kindness. Because mm -hmm. if you're nice and you're enjoying yourself and you're not going to let them kill you vibe, then they just look like the worst, the worst person in the world. How could anybody be mad at me, right? Like, I'm just, this is me all day, right? I, I had an, I had a conflict with a coworker at one point and people were just like, why do you mean to Joe? Like, what did he do to you? Did he disagree with you on something? Yeah, of course I did. Cause I was standing up for what we needed to do. You know, hold that grudge, hold the grudge. That's your energy. That ain't mine. Right. This is, you know, for us to be creative, we have to be up, right? We, our energy has to be up. Our thoughts have to be up. If you get blocked, go for a walk. Jump on a bike, go somewhere, take five minutes. We all get blocked sometimes. We all have designers blocked. We all have creators blocked. You know, don't let it get to you. It's just, it happens. Right. Yeah. I think this session has been a personality test, a personality lesson, a, a communication lesson, and everything that a designer has to be. I yeah. think I, I hope everybody has picked up on all of that and storytelling as well. Being the moderator, I should be looking at the time and seeing if you're overshooting, but it was such a pleasure listening to you. And I don't even want to stop now. 
I, I would okay, definitely. Uh, one last that. thing, because there's always one last thing. Um, oh, of course. As you mentioned the personality thing, everybody yeah. out there, you don't have to be like this. You can be an introvert. You can be quiet. You can literally be yourself because that's what you always have to be. When it comes to just delivering a presentation, that's when you turn it on. For 40 minutes, half hour, that's when you turn on. It doesn't even have to be a little bit of personality. Like it could just be enough that you display the information correctly and engage the people that you're talking to. That's it. It doesn't always have to be a fucking cartoon character from New York like me. That's just who I am 90% of the day. So I just want you to know that you guys are not like, don't ever be like, oh my God, I saw this session with this guy. I can never do that. You can. I, I once did, I worked with this young kid. I know I, I'm over, but uh, I worked once worked with this young kid. He was the fucking most amazing person I've ever seen speak. Literally only, I only heard him talk in presentations because every time I'm like, hey, what do you think about this? Looks good. You could probably change that. Like, all right, sounds good. good you know, and then I would, I would do this show and then I'd be like, oh, I'm gonna pass it off to him. And he'd pop in, he would say what he needed to say. And then I was always like, fuck, I need to follow that? Like, your words have impact. So always remember that. That's awesome, Joe. I, I think <laughs> you've summed up everything and people have too many things to go back and Google about after this session. So we have come to the end of our session and you can connect with Joe on ADP List, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, Instagram. I think you're active on every single platform, which is great. I am. I am yeah. uh, way too involved. <laughs> we love that. We love that. And uh, do send me your feedback on the topics you want to listen to the next time, uh, all of you that are, that's attending this session, because we will get the speaker to talk on that topic for you. And finally... Um, or not. I can talk for anything for two hours. So. <laughs> we can get back Joe to talk about any topic you want. <laughs> And if you're interested in boot camps, you should visit Design Boat website because um, they have demo classes every Sunday and a Q&A with the CEO who is Harsha. So you should go and res register for that. Oh, wow. You Hold on. Demos? Demos every Sunday? Every Sunday. Oh, that is cool. Yeah. Do it just to join that because I'm trying to get demos going at my job and I was hurt. I was just told, you know... That seems like people won't attend. Who wouldn't want to see stuff built on a platform? And where you can put it, right? Everybody wants to see that. Exactly. That's all. We love that. So what's thanks, the, thanks everybody. What's the URL? Hold on, before you go, because somebody asked, what's the URL for the for design boat? Uh just type in design boat on Google. I'm pretty sure you'll find it. There. Thank you. I just I was very lazy to Google and paste it in the chat. <laughs> that's yes, that's the one. Yes. Cool. Awesome. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So thanks a lot, Joe. Uh, thanks Thank you thanks guys. Everybody for attending. This was amazing. Have a great week. You guys are great. Have a wonderful day, evening. I don't know. Whatever time's on your end, you might be going to bed now. So we'll get a drink. Hold on. It's almost 12 o'clock here. We can all drink together. <laughs> awesome. This is great. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. So what do you mean you didn't have to watch the clock? <laughs> I know I didn't let you do much moderating. I'm sorry. Oh no, I'm so glad. It's it's a lot of pressure, and I'm not very great on stage. So you you, oh, you please. this is great. It's all conversation, right? What plans after this? What's what's your day going to be like? Uh, I am now back to back until eight thirty tonight. Oh, so much fun. Are you excited? No. <laughs> There's going to be more coffee in my in my future. Right. And then okay. more more time just turning uh, turning my camera off and just staring at the nonsense behind me. <laughs> oh oh, I should have taken a screenshot of that just to go. Oh, I'll send you a picture. I have I have a picture. Awesome. That will help. <laughs> <laughs> oh my Thanks god! So Thank you so I'm much, everyone. Yes. Stop.